God is good. All the time. All the time. God is good. We do welcome you to the service of worship in the Baptist Church of Kent. Welcoming all of you here in person, those who are connecting online. We rejoice to be gathering on this beautiful day. During the organ prelude, we invite all of you here in person, we invite all of you connecting, connecting via the live stream to be in a time of silent prayer, to have an attitude of quiet reflection, opening yourself to God's presence with you, preparing your heart for worship. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Our worship bulletin, which lists the order of the service, uh, people who are leading in the service, also print announcements, is available online. For everyone that's available online, you can get to it uh, on a cell phone or on a computer if you're at home uh, at uh, info.kentmethodist.org. Uh, that has lots of other uh, information and uh, points of connection. There's a place for first-time visitors uh, to uh, fill out some personal information so we can be in touch with you as a church and uh, keep you updated about church life. Uh, for those here in person, there are also some connect cards in the pews that do the same thing. You can fill those out and drop them in an offertory plate. Uh, we are passing the plates now, uh, uh, again, during the offertory, and you'll find other information there, prayer cards. Um, uh, sermon note cards, uh, inf information about uh, uh, online giving. We have altar flowers at our traditional services dedicated to the glory of God. These flowers are then taken to shut-ins or persons who've been dealing with illnesses or who've had deaths in their family. Those deliveries are made by members of our United Methodist Women. It's a wonderful ministry. The flowers themselves are given by members of our congregation, generally in honor or memory of someone. And you can sign up to donate flowers for a future Sunday on the flower calendar in the atrium. 
Vacation Bible School is coming up in mid-July. We look forward to that event once again in the life of our church. There's full information on our website at kentmethodist.org, and there are, uh, there's a registration uh, uh, opportunity there through our website. In our prayer concerns this morning, Margie Stahl is recuperating from surgery. Mark Anderson is going in for surgery this week. Les and Jessica Bennett's grandson, Henry, was uh, in for surgery this past week. Hal Hall and Pat Ginn have both been in the hospital. Candy Thaxton has been dealing with illness at home. And our thoughts and prayers with Pat and Dave Ginn and family upon the death of their sister-in-law this past week. <coughs> the church in our district for which we are praying this morning is the Doylestown United Methodist Church. If you have a prayer concern, you can get it to us through Facebook Messenger. It will be lifted up throughout the week by our intercessory prayer group. Today, we like to take a moment to have a mission moment focusing upon our Native American ministries. We are blessed as a United Methodist Church to have quite a range of ministries among Native Americans. We support those ministries through a special offering each year, and uh, we'd like to share with you now a word, a video, about our Native American ministries. When the United Methodist Church educates and trains a generation of young members, it is creating a generation of leaders. Shiloh O'Neill is one of those future leaders who is studying at Duke Divinity School in Durham, North Carolina. She is a recipient of a scholarship through the Native American Ministry Sunday Offering and is grateful for the opportunity. Apprentice Trey Harris is also a seminary student at Duke Divinity School. As a Native American, he realizes how important it is to continue his education for his people as well as the United Methodist Church. Your generous gifts benefit Native American outreach within annual conferences and across the United States. These funds also provide seminary scholarships for Native Americans. can contribute to our Native American ministries by simply marking a donation for Native American ministries. I invite you now to stand to join in the call to worship from the book of the prophet Isaiah. Let us stand as we uh, join responsively in these words of the scripture. Sing to the Lord a new song, God's praise from the end of the earth. Let the sea roar and all that fills it let all nations and their peoples exult. Let us pray. Inspire us, O God, this morning to lift our spirits to you in faith and in praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let us join in our opening hymn, 152, I Sing the Almighty Power of God.
And let us continue with the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray. Let us pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We continue with hymn 2080, All I Need Is You. Good morning. The first scripture reading this morning comes from the book of Isaiah. Thus says God, the Lord, who created the heavens and stretched them out, who spread out the earth and what comes from it, who gives breath to the people upon it and spirit to those who walk in it. I am the Lord. I have called you in righteousness. I have taken you by the hand and kept you. I have given you as a covenant to the people, a light to the nations, to open the eyes that are blind, to bring out the prisoners from the dungeon, from the prison, those who sit in darkness. I am the Lord, that is my name. My glory I give to no other, nor my praise to idols. See. Former things have come to pass, and new things I now declare. Before they spring forth, I tell you of them. The second passage <coughs> excuse me, is from the Gospel of Mark. They went to Capernaum, and then, when the Sabbath came, he entered the synagogue and taught. They were astounded at his teachings, for he taught with one having authority, and not as the scribes. Just then there was in their synagogue a man with unclean spirit, and he cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit, throwing him into convulsions and crying with a loud voice, came out of him. They were amazed, and they kept asking one another, what is this, a new teaching with authority? He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. At once his fame began to spread throughout the surrounding regions of Galilee. Galilee, excuse me. The word of God for the people of God. God. Our sanctuary choir now shares with us the anthem, From All That Dwell Below the Sky.
Our next scripture reading comes from the book of Acts. While Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was deeply distressed to see that the city was full of idols. So he argued in the synagogue with the Jews and the devout persons and also in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be there. Also some Epicurean and Stoic philosophers debated with him. Some said, what does this babbler want to say? Others said, he seems to be a proclaimer of foreign divinities. This was because he was telling the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. So they took him and brought him to the Areopagus and asked him, may we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting? It sounds rather strange to us, so we would like to know what it means. Now all the Athenians and the foreigners living there would spend their time in nothing but telling or hearing something new. Then Paul stood in front of the Areopagus and said, Athenians, I see how extremely religious you are in every way. For as I went through the city and looked carefully at the objects of your worship, I found among them an altar with the inscription, To an unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, he who is Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in shrines made by human hands, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mortals life and breath and all things. From one ancestor, he made all nations to inhabit the earth. He allotted the times of their existence and the boundaries of the places where they would live so that they would search for God and perhaps grope for him and find him, though indeed he is not far from any one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as even some of your own poets have said, or we too are his offspring. Since we are God's offspring, we ought not to think that the deity is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and imagination of mortals. While God has overlooked the times of human ignorance, now he commands all peoples everywhere to repent, because he has fixed a day on which he will have the world judged in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed, and of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. When they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some scoffed, but others said, we will hear you again about this. And then from the Gospel of Luke, Jesus said, to what should I compare the kingdom of God? It is like yeast that a woman took and mixed in with three measures of flour until all of it was leavened. May God grant us understanding of his holy word. For our next hymn, Over My Head, number 2148, the leader parts will be sung by Tom Emmerich. We join in singing the responses and the refrain. Let us stand as we sing.
seated. The sermon this morning is a continuation of a sermon series entitled, The Truth Will Set You Free, based upon the teaching of Jesus. If you abide in my word, you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. We are looking further this morning at the nature of God's truth and how it works in human lives. Let's be for a moment in the spirit of prayer. May the words of my mouth and meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Recently, there has been a lot of uproar in our country over critical race theory. Critical race theory, as you may know, is a way of looking at history and society through the lens of race and recognizing that racism is not only a matter of personal attitudes, but it is a systemic problem as racism becomes embedded in the way in which social systems operate. The concepts of critical race theory have been a part of discussions on college campuses and elsewhere for decades, but recently it has all become politicized, as so many things are these days, and also sensationalized through certain media channels. And in recent weeks, several states have passed laws banning the teaching or use of critical race theory in public schools. Whatever you think of critical race theory, I find it is never a good thing when politicians decide what teachers can teach. Multiple states have now banned critical race theory from public schools. One of the early states in this movement was Tennessee which is interesting since Tennessee a century ago was at the center of another movement to ban a certain subject from public schools as it, along with other states, banned the teaching of evolution, which led, of course, to the infamous Scopes trial in 1925 in Dayton, Tennessee. At that time, many people and many churches in America stood opposed to the theory of evolution fearing that it threatened Christian faith and American values. Today, there are some people, some churches, some self-proclaimed Christian preachers that, who oppose critical race theory on similar grounds. In this context, it's very significant to note the stance that Methodists took a century ago in the midst of the evolution controversy. Methodists welcomed the new insights of science. The Methodist Review, a prominent magazine at the time, stated that evolution is in harmony with the correct interpretation of Christian truth. The Methodists argued that biblical literalists in those days were distorting the Bible. At the same time, they noted that some evolutionists were wrongly trying to make evolution into a philosophy of all existence. Methodist leaders saw evolutionary science and faith as mutually compatible. Truth was to be found by putting the two together. This corresponds with a general perspective that Methodists have had throughout history. We are open to new ideas. We integrate thinking, and we encourage developments in every academic field, even if those developments may at times be unsettling. In recent years, there have been quite a few people, including some Christians, who've taken a basic stance in which they are simply resistant to new ways of thinking or understanding the world. In the minds of some, Christianity is to be identified with the familiar and the old. New ideas are seen as a threat. But this is not the attitude in much of Christian history or in the biblical story. 
You can see this in the scriptures that we heard this morning. Early in his public ministry, Jesus entered a synagogue and began teaching. The people were astonished by his teaching because it was completely different from what they typically heard from the scribes. Then a man appeared who is described as being possessed by an unclean spirit. This is the way in which first century people would typically talk about those with mental illness. They had no cure for such persons and generally sought to keep their distance. But Jesus healed the man. And in amazement, the crowd exclaimed, what is this, a new teaching with authority? He commands even the unclean spirits and they obey him. In Jesus' words and in Jesus' actions, people perceived that something dramatically new was happening. Jesus fulfilled what the prophet Isaiah was talking about in the passage we heard, where the Lord says, new things, I declare. Jesus brought a message that challenged customary ways of thinking and behaving. He opened people's minds to new understandings of God. The apostles carried this forth. When Paul went to speak in Athens, people perceived that he was saying something new. He went on to directly challenge their traditional forms of religion. And he concluded by presenting what they considered a radical teaching when he spoke about Jesus rising from the dead. The gospel message was thoroughly disruptive when it was proclaimed in the pagan world. In fact, the biblical story as a whole is a continuous narrative of people under God's inspiration challenging old ways of thought and presenting truths which ultimately transformed people's understanding of the whole world around them. This dynamic is at the heart of the book that we just published, 10 Transforming Truths, which reviews 10 major truths which are proclaimed in the biblical narrative which were new at the time they were first declared and which finally transformed the way in which people think about life. Throughout the centuries, leading Christians have continued in this spirit, applying biblical principles in new ways to human societies. Movements to stop the age-old practice of slavery or to change how the justice system works moving from a punitive to a reformative focus, or to create a social safety net to keep people out of abject poverty, all had their impetus from Christians who saw that God was calling people to new ways of thinking and acting. This does not, of course, mean that every new idea is a good one, but it does mean that believers in every age should be on the forefront of positive change. We never need fear new ideas, but can be receptive to the possibility that God is working yet again to bring new perspectives and new understanding. So for example, with regard to that evolution controversy in the last century, Methodists were receptive to the insights of geology and biology because they perceived that they could move people to a deeper understanding of the created world. The scriptures declare that God is creator, and the scriptures note that the natural world is a marvelous work of artistry, something we can easily observe in these beautiful summer days. But the Bible never addresses the mechanics of how the world took shape. With our God-given minds, we've now been able to understand those mechanics, and our modern understandings of evolution and geological processes actually can lead us to a far greater appreciation for the creative work of God. It used to be that people saw God as creator as being rather much like a human designer or builder who, who must have directly put together every plant and animal and a rock that we see. With modern scientific understandings, the creative working of God appears as much more sublime for now we can perceive how God has created extraordinary structures in the universe, dynamics of physics and chemistry and biology, which become engines of creativity, endlessly spawning new realities. 
In other words, God does not just create things. God creates creativity, a universe in which the power of creativity is built into its essence. And this finally culminates in human beings, who themselves are the creators of new things. Methodists were right a century ago when they recognize that the concepts of evolution work in tandem with faith to help us appreciate far more the creative power of God. Of course, there are still Christians today who reject the idea of evolution because it disrupts the way in which they want to think about creation. But truth, whenever it appears in the human story, is always disruptive. Biblical faith, in fact, has been the most disruptive force in human history. In ancient days, for example, people everywhere believed that the world was in the hands of multiple squabbling gods. Biblical people of faith declared that there is one God, a unifying power who holds together a universe of goodness and order and beauty. That idea was so radical that early Christians were accused of being atheists because they denied the existence of all the Roman and Greek gods that people venerated in temples and statues all over the place. In first century Jewish society, the scribes taught that God is one who blesses the righteous and punishes the sinner. Jesus proclaimed that God is merciful and will forgive even the worst sinner who repents. This idea was so disruptive that Jesus was accused of being lawless and a friend of the worst miscreants. The scribes also wanted to think that they were the chosen people and the rest of the world was beyond the pale of God's blessing. But Jesus sent his followers to take the good news to the whole world, the news of God's grace to all people. That transformed the Roman Empire, and the spread of the gospel has been continually disruptive throughout human history, challenging old ways of thinking, bring about new and far better ways of living. So if we are receptive to God's truth today, we can expect that it will be disruptive in our own lives, and that can be a good thing we tend to get into comfortable patterns in our thinking and our behavior. We don't like disruption. But look at what Jesus does in the Gospels. He goes up to some fishermen who are doing their usual thing of mending their nets. He calls them to leave their entire lifestyle to become disciples. He goes into the synagogue in the story that we heard, and he dramatically shifts from their usual format to bring what they describe as a new teaching. Jesus would go on to heal a leper, and when word of that got out, it disrupted the whole region, so much so that Jesus could no longer enter a town because the crowds would be overwhelming. All that happens in Mark chapter 1. Jesus was incredibly disruptive. But the change that he brought every time was enormously positive, transforming people's lives. So today, we are invited to look for how Christ might disrupt our habits, our attitudes, our own ways of thinking, because the new things that Christ does in human lives would bring people to share more fully in God's grace, God's truth, and God's redeeming power. If we open ourselves to Christ, we then very likely will be moved to become disruptors in the world around us. Think about leading Christians in every age. They have always appeared as terribly disruptive. Think about Martin Luther King Jr., or John Wesley, or Martin Luther. They were all viewed, in fact, as troublemakers because they were upsetting established ways of thinking and doing things. Jesus was seen as the ultimate troublemaker, but they were, in fact, instruments of God's disruptive truth. 
a little over a week ago at our annual conference, we overwhelmingly passed a resolution entitled, A Covenant to Continue Our Work for Racial Justice. The resolution did not mention critical race theory, but it was a call to Methodists that we need to think in new ways about the racist legacy in our society so that we can continue to be a part of God's work to disrupt the structures of racism in our time. It is significant in this regard to note the basic images that Jesus used to describe the nature of Christian living. In the Sermon on the Mount, he said that Christians should be salt. Salt dramatically alters the taste of food whenever it is applied. He said that Christians should be light. Light totally changes a dark room when it is turned on. And in the parable we heard, Jesus said, to what should I compare the kingdom of God? It is like yeast that a woman took and mixed in with three measures of flour until all of it was leavened. The quantity of flour mentioned here, three measures, is actually a very large amount. Yeast is small. But of course, when mixed into the flour, yeast completely changes it, causing it, when baked, to become bread or cake. Salt, light, and yeast are all elements which disrupt the status quo into which they are introduced. The disruption in each case is thorough, and it is for the good. So we are to be yeast in today's world. We may seem small, but through God's empowerment, we can share in God's disruptive truth and so participate in the transformation and the renewal that God brings about in human lives. Let us pray. O oh Lord, speak to us afresh today that we may hear your truth for our own lives truth that might disrupt our thinking and our actions in ways, truth that would lead us to be transformed in your grace. Inspire us, O oh Lord, that we might hear how your spirit is speaking and working in us, that we might come to new vision for life, we might come to new insights, new understandings, that we might be able to grow as your people and inspire us then, O oh God, to join together that we might be participants in speaking forth your disruptive truth in our world. We thank you that we are called not simply to follow you alone, but to join together in your church. And we thank you for the many ways that we can work together as your people to be instruments of, of your grace and power and truth in our time. We do reach out to persons who are in times of illness or dealing with surgeries. We lift up those persons uh, who've been having uh, uh, times of challenge in recent days. We lift up especially uh, Margie Stahl, uh, Mark Anderson, Hal Hall, Pat Ginn, Candy Thaxton, Les and Jessica Bennett's uh, grandson, Henry. We pray in every case, O oh Lord, for your healing power to be at work. We also remember those who are mourning, and we lift up uh, Pat and Dave Ginn, especially upon the death of their sister-in-law. We pray, O oh Lord, that you might speak anew to us that good news of the resurrection, and we might find our everlasting hope in you. We thank you that we can reach out beyond our local church. We thank you for our connection with other United Methodist congregations, and pray especially this morning for the Doylestown United Methodist Church. We thank you for ways we can be in mission in the world, we give thanks for our mountaintop team just returned from Tennessee and ministry in the mountains there last night. In the context of the dreadful history of how Native Americans have been treated in, in this land, we thank you, Lord, that today we can join as a church with Native Americans to work together in new ways, to grow together in faith and to be instruments of, of your good news and your love in our world. We pray you would guide us, O oh God, in the midst of a world of strife and a world of confusion to hear your word to us that we indeed might have our eyes, our hearts opened to grow 
in your truth, to share in your grace, to be empowered by your love and your righteousness that we may share today as your disciples and reach out with your good news, your compassion to all the world. In the name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior, we pray. Amen. We respond now to God's grace and God's call to the giving of our tithes and our offerings. Our offertory music this morning features Sarah Miller on flute and uh, Don Miller on organ.
Eternal God, we give thanks for the blessings that you pour out upon us and for the opportunity we have to share in your transforming work in our world today. O Lord, we pray your blessing upon these gifts that they might further your purposes. Send us forth, O God, into the empowerment of your spirit that we might share in the outreach of your truth and your grace to all the world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We join in the hymn, Go Forth for God. be seated. Let us hear now this closing scripture from Ephesians. May the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, give you a spirit of wisdom and of revelation as you come to know Christ, having the eyes of your heart enlightened so that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward all who believe? We invite you now to simply remain seated for the trait of postlude. Let this be a time of reflection, a time of lifting your heart in thanks and praise to God. There will be a final blessing after that.
Our choir shares with us now a benediction. Go forth now in peace to love and serve the Lord. Amen. <laughs>